Hello and welcome to ITV News Meridian in the South East. Tonight's headlines this Monday evening. We're out on patrol with the traffic police on the M25 who are trying to make sure that this becomes unacceptable. Using a mobile phone, um, it, it distracts you momentarily. Um, it's as dangerous as, as being drunk behind the wheel. Um, and it is one of the four main causes of, of road deaths in the UK. The Chatham man accused of sending a suspicious package to a COVID vaccine factory in Wales goes on trial. Also tonight, what happens when golf meets football? The primary school teacher who's got it down to a T, helping Team GB. And the beauty of the Sussex Kelp Forest. Why its richness is being celebrated on what was recently a plain old council building. Good evening. You can get six points on your licence and a £200 fine. But even with hefty penalties, some drivers think they'll chance it by using a mobile phone at the wheel. So today, seven police forces across the South East joined together to crack down on lawbreakers on the M25. Officers are using three unmarked lorry cabs to patrol the motorway over the next fortnight, using the raised driving position to catch those who think they'll get away with it. And as Kip Bradshaw reports, their efforts are paying off. In slow-moving traffic, the added height of a lorry cab gives these police officers the perfect vantage point to keep a close eye on other motorists. Tim, you've got a white van on the crossing. And they've just spotted a van driver appearing to use his mobile phone while behind the wheel. Backup is just a radio call away. A quick thumbs up signals it's the right vehicle and they pull it over. This is one of the first to be stopped on day one of Operation Orbital, a fortnight of action by police and other transport bodies to crack down on dangerous driving on the M25. Afternoon, sir. A lot of people will use a mobile phone still, but they'll hold it down out of sight um, where, where it can't be seen. And by being that much higher, we can actually look directly down into their vehicle and we can see their, their behaviour. In, in effect, using a mobile phone, uh, research has shown that um, it's as dangerous as, as being drunk behind the wheel. This is one of three unmarked lorry cabs, nicknamed the super cabs, being used on the motorway over the next two weeks, with officers using a handheld camera to record evidence of offending. Unfortunately, we see a lot of incidents on our network that are completely avoidable, where people just aren't paying attention. So hopefully by publicising widely that we do this, although we're focusing on the M25 over the next two weeks, actually there is one cab operating out in the south all the time. In the last year, officers from the Surrey and Sussex forces stopped 481 vehicles because of behaviour spotted from an unmarked HGV cab, while Essex police stopped 177 and officers in Kent pulled over 48. Earlier this year, a truck driver on the M4 was recorded using not one, but two mobile phones while also trying to drive his vehicle. Back on the M25 in Kent, a quick roadside inspection of the van hasn't thrown up any other problems. The driver will be getting a ticket in the post for allegedly failing to be in proper control of the vehicle. So I gave him a bit of education as well, told him to get a cradle, put it in, in, in the stand, so in the future he don't have to keep looking down, because he could easily be looking down at his phone, not see what's happening in front of him and be involved in the collision. With far more lorries on our motorways than traffic police, it's hoped this safety initiative will make drivers think twice before breaking the law. After all, you never know who could be watching. Kit Bradshaw, ITV News, Farrakh. A man has appeared in court following the attempted theft of a cash machine in Canterbury. Police responded to reports of a digger being used to smash through a building in St Martin's Hill to reach the ATM in the early hours of Friday morning. 29-year-old James Collins from Maidstone has been charged with burglary and dangerous driving. The man's been jailed for more than three years after he assaulted a woman in a Gatwick hotel in September. 33-year-old Craig Goodwin had only been released from prison a month before for assaulting the same victim. 
He was also found guilty of breaching a restraining order by contacting her. The Vicar of Gillingham has been chosen to become the next Bishop of Loughborough. The Reverend Saju Muthalali from St Mark's and St Mary's Island will become the youngest Anglican Bishop in England. A jury heard today that a man from Kent accused of sending a suspicious package to a Covid vaccine factory had also sent packages to 10 Downing Street, a US airbase in Gloucestershire and the leader of North Korea. The bomb squad were called after Anthony Collins, who's 53 and from Chatham, posted the parcel to the site in North Wales, allegedly with the intention of sparking a security alert. Sarah Saunders is at Maidstone Crown Court for us. Sarah. Anthony Collins is accused of sending that package with the deliberate intention of creating a security alert at the Covid vaccine centre. The pharmaceutical company in North Wales takes the AstraZeneca vaccine, puts it into glass vials before it's distributed across the NHS. On the Monday in question, the postal worker and security staff, when they picked up the package, were suspicious. They decided to leave it outside by some bushes. 120 staff were evacuated and the production line ground to a halt while the bomb squad were called. They x-rayed the package and seeing that there was some possible evidence of circuitry decided to carry out a controlled explosion. Forensic examination would show that in fact the package contained no explosive material. What it did contain was a calculator, some batteries and some paperwork. On one of those pieces of paper was Mr Collins' address and a message saying contact the police. Now today the jury heard that in interviews Mr Collins had admitted sending this parcel and some others but said he was in fact trying to help the scientific community with the cure for Covid saying and here I am getting into trouble. But the prosecution suggested that having sent packages like this in the past not least to Kent Police where the package was seen as a potential threat in fact Mr Collins must have known that sending a package of this sort would create a security alert. Mr Collins has pleaded not guilty to intending to create the belief that he had sent explosive material. The trial continues. Sarah, thank you. You're watching ITV News here in the Meridian region. Thank you for choosing us. Coming up, Sarah's here with all your sport. And have you noticed the lack of acorns this year? Well, you're not going nuts. Could the weather be to blame? I'll have more on that and your full forecast. Look forward to it. And you can find more on today's top stories in the South East by going to our website. Head to itv.com forward slash Meridian. You can call us on 0808 1010 095. And remember, you can also follow us on Facebook and on Twitter. Now, a new study has found as many as one in five children report being bullied a lot or always, with disabled young people among the most likely to be targeted. The findings have been released at the start of Anti-Bullying Week to raise awareness of the long-term mental health impacts of people who are harmed. Well, experts say it can cause anxiety and even depression running into adulthood. Matt Price has been speaking to children in Kent about the importance of stamping it out. Our cameras are at Turner Free School in Folkestone in Kent, hearing from students as part of Anti-Bullying Week. The children here know to be kind and respectful to one another and tell us how important it is in the fight against bullying. I mean, if you, if you saw bullying going on here, what, what, what would you do about it? I'd go and find a trusted adult. Um, I'd talk to a teacher or like the pastoral leaders or anyone that I knew that the person being bullied trusted so they'd listen to them. I would like ask them how long it's been happening and what's the worst thing that's happened to them and then I go and find the best person to deal with it. A new study shows one in five pupils in England report being bullied a lot or always. The report also found one in 12 children say that other pupils frequently tease them. One in 16 say they're picked on by others because they're a bit different. So bullying can affect all children, but we know that some children are more likely to experience it than others. And our research has shown that disabled children, children with SCN, and children who are on free school meals are significantly more likely to experience bullying than others. 
The way in which bullies target their victims is changing all the time, in person and now via the internet. Now I'm going to play you a video very shortly. Lucy Howard is from the charity Bullies Out and runs a series of workshops for parents to help them identify the signs. So, for example, if I was being bullied online and I carry a digital device around with me, it's the equivalent of carrying a bully around in my pocket. They can access me whenever they want. They're from the privacy of my bedroom, 24-7, and so it's far more invasive um, than it used to be. Research also shows that severe and frequent bullying can have a long-lasting impact on children's mental well-being, something which continues into adulthood. You know, sometimes I've had to give adults medication because of the severity of uh, their mental health as a result of, of bullying or they've required prolonged time off work. So it has really long lasting implications on people's mental and physical health. This year's campaign is entitled One Kind Word, suggesting how small acts can have a big impact. There is a united view in the fight against bullying. If you see it or hear it, call it out and never suffer in silence. Matt Price, ITV News. And of course, more information online. Now, we might have been spared the worst of the winter weather so far, but sooner or later, it's going to get colder and wetter. Absolutely. In Kent alone, 71,000 homes are at risk of flooding. One of the reasons why the Environment Agency is increasing capacity at a crucial flood storage area. But we can all get involved too, as Tony Green will tell us. Kent, where it's anything but sunny. A few hours of devastating rain and the whole southeast is hit by Britain's worst floods for 15 years. One of the worst hit towns is Tunbridge. The high street is a river... 1968 and the river Medway bursts its banks. A devastating flood that led to an engineering solution to a natural problem. This is the Lye Flood Storage Area. Built to protect Tunbridge, it's here the Environment Agency monitors rainfall and river levels and can control the flow of the Medway. What difference has this flood storage area made to Tunbridge and the surrounding area? It's, it's substantially reduced flood risk. Before it was constructed, we'd see flooding in Tunbridge probably every 10 years or so. Uh, the most significant recent event being 1968, which prompted the construction of the live flood storage area. Since it was constructed, we've only seen flooding in Tunbridge to any great extent on two occasions in 2000 and in 2013. In the event of heavy rain, these three gates are used to control the flow of the river and hold back almost five and a half million cubic metres of water and protect 1,200 homes downstream. Now the Environment Agency has been allowed to store more water by building another embankment at Hildenborough and raising the maximum storage level 55 centimetres. More than 8 million cubic metres of water can be stored offering better protection to more properties. We can have some years where we don't operate the flood storage area at all. Looking at the data overall, we, it's difficult to draw any conclusions from that. Uh, but we're certainly seeing, I think, more unpredictable weather and we seem to have more intense rainfall on occasions than we might have seen in the past. You're increasing capacity here. We've got this structure that's now been in place for 40 years. Is it possible to protect every home? Is it possible to protect every area from flooding? Unfortunately not, but hence why in some areas we really need to look at uh, how we can make homes and, and, and businesses more resilient to flooding. The agency also trains people to be flood wardens, a vital link between neighbours and emergency services. Carl Lewis has been a warden since 2014. I wanted to do it because of what I had seen and helped out with in the flooding uh, at Christmas in 2013. I wanted to try and help out as much as I could to make sure it didn't happen again. The training involves making sure that you are safe while you're doing the work, but also identifying what you need to do. It's making sure that you provide information quickly to the residents affected. Making sure that the river is cave, there's no obstructions. Tunbridge has about two and a half thousand properties that are at risk from flooding and in an event like we had in 2013 we would need about a hundred flood warnings for that to get as many people informed as to what's going on as possible. Work to extend the flood storage area begins next year but wardens are needed all across the county to make sure that when the waters rise we know what to do. Tony Green, ITV News, Tunbridge.
Now, fish and plants that are found in the sea off the Sussex coast are being celebrated in a unique art display. A large mural has been painted on one of the offices of Worthing Council. It depicts the underwater kelp forests that stretch from Rye to Chichester. Moves are currently underway to protect these areas, as Tom Savides will tell us. <laughs> Have you ever wondered what lives in the sea off the Sussex coast? Well, now you can find out. Artist Sarah Gillings has painted a mural on this council office on Worthing Seafront. It reflects the types of fish and plants that are found just a few metres away in the water. In the street and in the urban setting, I think it's a lovely reminder for us about all the nature that we are losing. Underwater forests where the giant seaweed kelp grows used to thrive along the coast from Rye to Chichester. Over the years they've dwindled because of trawl fishing and climate change. This mural may look rather exotic but everything you see behind me from the cuttlefish to the kelp can be found in the sea off the Sussex coast. This piece of art was commissioned by Worthing and Ada Council to highlight the need to preserve sea life. As a borough council, we're heavily committed towards the climate change agenda. We've declared a climate emergency, and part of that is making recognising that we need to carbon capture and helping the kelp, the re restoration of the kelp beds off Worthing and on the Sussex Bay area is really important to us. And we want to make that in the signalling here in the artwork that we see behind us. We rarely get to see the rich and varied fish and plants that live in the sea. This mural aims to change that. Tom Savidas, ITV News, Worthing. Yeah, it cheers up the building, doesn't yeah, it? It's Good lovely. idea. Holly's with us now, and Holly, there's a shortage of acorns. There is. Have you noticed there is barely an acorn to be found anywhere? We no, haven't I, noticed. I haven't noticed that. Until you said it today, yeah. Fred and I were having a little chat, and we on, thought, on what do you never base this? Well, lots of our viewers have noticed, have and they? my mum mentioned it as well. Oh, your mum so, uh, did. So, so, she? It's fine. Thank you for asking. <laughs> um, <laughs> acorns. They naturally come in a boom and bust cycle. So last year was a boom year. Acorns everywhere, but this year, as I say, hardly any. Um, partly a natural thing. Partly the weather. So last spring, 2020, warm, dry, sunny. Trees love that. It's good for the growing flowers. It's good for the pollination. This year, cold, wet, and of course the complete opposite. But I tell you what, what? oak trees are amazing. I learned today that 2,300 species rely on oak trees. Wow. Okay, so they they support uh, 2,300 species. Just some of them. The squirrel. Got a lovely photo here. This is a grey squirrel as came in from Broadstairs. Uh, we've got um, deer, this is a fallow Beautiful. deer, they eat acorns. Uh, you've got things like the great spotted woodpecker, which not only eat the acorns, uh, but also nest in them as well. So incredibly important trees. If this happened every year, it would be of concern. But because it is a natural cycle, it should be back to normal next year or the year after. You are a mine of information, you Too are. kind. <laughs> You're going to come on how with me? Oh, I'm invited. <laughs> <laughs> How's the weather looking? Let's find out. Here's Holly again. A fairly quiet look to things over the next few days, or at least that's what I've gone with for my headline, by which I mean not much in the way of any rain, not much wind, a lot of dry weather, fairly cloudy skies, but some brightness around, and I think the best chance of that is probably on Wednesday. The chance of some mist and fog as well, perhaps a bit tonight, maybe a bit tomorrow night, although perhaps not too much of it. High pressure then dominating, mild air in place at the moment. We do see a swooping down of the jet stream around the middle part of the working week. That brings some chillier air our way, but equally probably some brighter skies. But then as it loops to the north once again, high pressure builds back in. And again, we find ourselves with mild but also quite cloudy conditions for the tail end of the working week and it's quite cloudy out there at the moment. Now, if we do get some clear spells, we could see some mist and fog forming, which could be quite thick, and maybe a touch of grass frost in places too. The cloud breaks are more likely to be a little bit further west, but I have to say the detail uh, in this sort of setup can be quite tricky to pin down. Maybe a shower or two, but uh, most of us in for a largely dry night. So some mist and fog perhaps tomorrow morning, which could be quite thick. That will lift and clear. Fairly cloudy skies for many, but hopefully some brighter spells coming through at times. Largely a dry story for tomorrow. And again, temperatures fairly similar to today's valleys. So getting up to around about 11 or 12 Celsius. Our high tide times have got Margate there at 9.58 and again at 10.39 as we head into the evening. 
and finally the outlook. So maybe a little mist and fog to start Wednesday. Otherwise, I think the brightest day of the week, they're perhaps feeling a little bit chillier and then cloudy skies, but milder conditions to end the working week. Have a good evening. And stay with us because in just a moment the ITV Evening News continues here with Mary Nightingale. I shall have our late news tonight at 10.35. Join me if you can. But for now, from the team here at ITV Meridian, thanks very much for watching. Enjoy your evening. Take care. I'll see you later. Sangeeta will see you. Tomorrow, hopefully. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.